Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Kalanadi. Today I'm going to do my January reading wrap up on time for once. I read nine things in January, which is a pretty low number for me, historically speaking. That's about half what I would usually read in a month, but it was really good for January because for most of the month, I did not feel like reading. I was busy doing other things and then I was sick and I almost never read when I'm sick. So uh, my reading pace really picked up at the end of the month. I've been really enjoying what I read, so it's all good basically. What you actually get first is editing Rachel from many hours in the future um, to let you know that I had so much to say about the first story I talked about, um, Adrian Tchaikovsky's Elder Race, that I'm actually putting that whole thing in a separate video. <laughs> it turned into like a whole review on its own, and I didn't realize that until I was editing. So that will be a separate video in the future, very, very near future. Um, the short version is that I really enjoyed this novella. It was kind of like Rachel Katniss in its ideas. Um, so I really enjoyed it, but like pretty much every other short form work that I've read by Adrian Tchaikovsky, it wasn't really long enough to fully satisfyingly develop all these big ideas. So I liked it, but it could have been twice as long and it would have been even better. So I'm hoping there's going to be like other stories in this world with these characters that would really be more satisfying to me, but who knows? It does stand on its own and that is also okay. Anyway, more on that in the future and now back to past me talking about the next thing. Next up is my only real like disappointment of January, I'm sad to say. This was a weird mix of a compulsive potato chippy read and then just kind of a sour ending for me. This book is Witch Please by Anne Aguirre. It is a like contemporary supernatural romance. It follows a modern day witch who runs a fix it shop with her cousin and uh, she's had like a terrible breakup with her ex and is kind of like punishing herself by going to his wedding to another woman and she comes home and she basically wants a rebound relationship to get her ex out of her system and then in to her shop walks this amazing man he is literally perfect in my opinion um, he's the local baker who is famous for his cinnamon rolls and he is gorgeous and he likes her he doesn't think that she is weird he wants to be around her They're, they have a lot of similarities so they really hit it off and she thinks that their relationship is just rebound. He's a mundane person. He's not from a magical family, so he can never know about this huge part of her life. So she can't really get that close to him, but he loves her. He thinks she's perfect and he's had a slew of failed relationships and desperately doesn't want to lose the woman of his dreams. So they're kind of talking past each other for a lot of the book. Um, and their their relationship was actually very cute. I felt their chemistry. I liked seeing them together. They were just so good together. And I wanted them to just sit down and go, this is what I want. I'm going to deal with all these other problems and get them out of the way so that we can be together. And they don't do that really. This is where my frustrations begin because both of these characters are dealing with some really toxic family problems. Um, mainly the, the female love interest grandmother is racist. It, yeah, and it's not like race, but she does not like mundane people and thinks that her daughter should marry the right kind of person, aka somebody who's a witch. Um, and it just, it felt like a really obvious analogy for racism, basically. And I just couldn't believe that the characters were not seeing this behavior and realizing how bad it was. So uh, to not spoil things, I will be vague at this point, but there are some things that are revealed about one of the families and some things that were done that cross ethical boundaries that should probably get people reported to the local witch council or just some like really weird communication lapses that I just did not understand. And I, I was, it left the book on a really sour note. I think it was supposed to end on this like big twist, but it felt extremely flat for me because I felt like it was actually a plot hole. It felt like a plot hole for convenience sake because the entire story would not have existed otherwise. And that really bothered me. I don't actually catch plot holes in books that often. It's not something that I'm good at seeing. So if I notice something in a book like this and just go, this is dumb. Why did the author decide to present it this way? That makes no sense. That's a major red flag for me. So 
a lot of this book was very enjoyable. I liked the romantic aspect of it a lot because that was cute, but the rest of it just irritated me a lot more than I thought it should. <laughs> So I think it's a duology. There's another book that's out soon, I think, and I don't plan on reading it because I don't care that much about this world and the characters that it's about were like my least favorite characters in this book. So I'm just gonna leave this one here and maybe someday I'll try something else by Anna Geary. I know she has other like fantasy, sci-fi, supernatural romances out there and other people like them. So I'm not done trying her work, but this was maybe not the best starting place for me. Then something that was also fantasy and romantic and I loved it, but it's completely different. That is Silver in the Wood by Emily Tesh. This novella came out a couple of years ago and people have raved about it. I've always meant to read it. I finally read it in January. A buddy read this with Libby. Her channel is Libby Stevenson. We both really enjoyed it. This is um, about a man named Tobias Finch who lives in a big ancient mysterious wood. He may be its caretaker. Um, and then one day a man named Henry Silver buys the local estate and comes to the wood. He's like a folklorist. He's very interested in the wood. He's very interested in Tobias's relationship with the wood. And then there is something there that Tobias is like protecting the people from. It emerges and they have to deal with it and may have taken silver. And of course there's romance. These two men have a thing for each other, but it's not like the major, major focus of the story by any means. It's just, it's there. I really loved the world building here, the magic. It's very mythical. Um, it's, it's based, I think, like on a lot of fables, the green man mythology. I really enjoy this and I think it was done well. Um, it's also kind of like historical fantasy. I, I don't know exactly when it's set. Libby and I talked about this a little bit. Maybe it's like the 1850s, but Tobias has actually lived for a very long time. He has experienced centuries and it's kind of confused about like what century it currently is. So sometimes it feels much, much older than that. And yeah, just I really enjoyed the characters. I think Tesh did an amazing job of introducing the characters in the world. There are some descriptions and hints in the first couple of pages that I kind of went back to reread and realized like she'd snuck in some things just so subtly, so beautifully done. But when you reread it, you realize what it meant. And I think that's just masterful. So this was really well written. I super enjoyed it. It was almost a five star read and I'm currently in the middle of the sequel, which is also very good. Now switching to some nonfiction, I listened to the audiobook of Immune, A Journey into the Mysterious System That Keeps You Alive by Philip Detmer. This is a really funny, irreverent explanation of the immune system. Um, I really like Philip Detmer's style. Um, he's the creator of the YouTube channel Kurzgesagt in a nutshell. And if you have watched any of those videos, the style of them, the voice of them is pretty much the same as the book and I really enjoy that. I'm also like pretty darn sure that the person who does the English narration of their videos is the audiobook narrator for this, and I really enjoy his voice. So this was just a really fun, deep dive into the immune system. It is very simplified in places, of course, because it's incredibly strange and weird sometimes. Um, but it was really good fun. I learned some interesting things from this. It's a book also that, because there's just so much going on, I think it would be worth rereading it at some point. Um, I usually cannot read about medical things. Um, it's one of my big anxiety triggers, but this was very abstract. It wasn't like um, taking real case studies of things that had happened to people and dissecting them. That would have been something I couldn't read. So it was very much the sort of abstract immune system explanation. And it was really interesting that I also was reading this right when I finally got sick with COVID because it does talk about the immune system and vaccines and COVID-19, it does directly talk about the pandemic and everything. So it was interesting to kind of understand a bit better what my immune system had just gone through and then what it was going through again with getting sick again. So 
all good fun, actually. I would definitely recommend this. I thought it was really fun and really educational. Next is a kind of fantastical literary work called The Cat Who Saved Books by Sosuke Natsukawa. This is translated into English by Louise Heal Kawai. This is a random library pick for me, and I thought it was okay. It is about a high school boy in Japan who has been living with his grandfather who runs a bookstore. His grandfather um, dies very unexpectedly, leaving this young man with the bookstore. He is not going to school anymore. He's and he's grieving his grandfather and probably going to leave and move in with his aunt. And then as he is in the bookstore, a talking cat appears and says that it needs his help in saving books. He goes on a series of adventures which read kind of like tests about how much you love books and it changes him basically. So this was kind of cute, I guess. Um, I feel like it was a story really, really written for people who revere books, not just for their contents, but also like the physical book for people who cannot stand to treat a book badly or to dog ear the pages, who kind of put books on a pedestal, if you were. Um, so a little bit of it didn't work for me in that sense because while I love books and reading and I love the knowledge in them, I did not feel like I was as precious about them as some of the, the characters were in this. On the whole though, I mean it has a good message in general, um, but I think it was probably best viewed for me as a story about a kind of lonely high school boy who realizes that, you know, books are his life and that's okay. <laughs> So it was a fun little read, but I don't think I'm going to remember much of it down the road. Then something I loved, I think this was my first five star read of the year, it is The Missing Page by Kat Sebastian. This is the long awaited sequel to Hither Page, which I reread back in December. This series is historical male male romance um, set right after World War II in England. It follows James, who is a doctor, and Leo, who is like a spy. In the first story, they meet. Um, for kind of like this murder investigation in a quiet English village and they fall for each other. In the second story they're basically in a relationship but they're coming to the point where they have to discuss how determined they are to be together and how are they going to manage that. And, and then James, the doctor, is called off to the reading of the will of a distant relative at their estate. And he goes and it turns into kind of this riff on an Agatha Christie style murder mystery. So there's actually no murder. I hope that's not a spoiler, but there is no murder. But there is an investigation into the disappearance of a young woman 20 years ago and the money that's at stake if they can figure out who it is. Um, so James goes off to this and then Leo, when he comes back into the country, runs off to go take care of him because he's like, this, this is not going to end well. Somebody's going to get poisoned over tea or something. So it is adorable and loving with the character's relationship, how much they want to take care of each other and they're dealing through their traumas from the past and trying to decide what to do together next. And it was also a really satisfying mystery that did not go the way that I thought it was going to. I thought it was going to be like a really classic murder mystery over like money or something. And it just, it was not about that. And I really liked the conclusion to it. I don't know if there's going to be a third story. I know that this story took some time to get out because it was it was difficult to write. I would love to read more about these characters. I think that a third story that dives more into Leo's backstory now that we know more about James would be a really great cap to like a trilogy, but I don't I don't know. I would highly recommend both of these stories, Hither Page and The Missing Page. Even if you're not like into romance, for example, this just like view this as a mystery series with a queer couple at the center of it. Like it's just it's really good no matter which way you slice and dice it. I really want to read more poetry this year, so I set out to do that uh, by resuming my read of Pablo Neruda's poetry. There's a series of bilingual editions of his work from Copper Canyon Press. They're all translated by William O'Daly, I believe, and I've really enjoyed the three I think that I've read before. So in January, I read The Hands of Day or Las Manos del Día. And I really enjoyed this. Um, I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to like 
pick out specific poems that I really enjoyed. Um, I think one of the very first ones in this, I think it might have been called like Destinies or something. I loved it. I have pretty uniformly enjoyed Neruda's poetry, his style, his topics, just his work really jives with something in me. Um, so I didn't love like every single piece in this collection, but it, it's very much about hands, about using hands to craft things, um, and about Neruda's uh, think, thinking about how he hasn't made many tangible things in his life. Like, there's an entire poem about how he's never made a chair. He's never made a chair that somebody else will use and sit in after he's gone. And that that contemplation of hands, of work, of the the physical things that people make and build and everything was really interesting. Um, Never would have thought that I would enjoy a poetry collection about this, but I really, I really liked it. This is also kind of a milestone for me because while I've read three previous bilingual editions like this, this is the first one that I intentionally read everything. I didn't just read the English, I read the Spanish as well, and I tried to understand the gist of every poem in Spanish. So I didn't always read the Spanish first. Uh, sometimes I read the English first and then the Spanish, but I like compared them and made sure that I understood like kind of some of the translation decisions and things. So it took me a while to read this because I was doing that. Um, my Spanish skills are not good enough to just sit down and read like a novel or poetry for goodness sake, but I, I love these editions, I love that they're bilingual, and I think that Will William O'Daly's translations are really good. They capture the essence of the poems, and I think I can understand that a little bit better now that I can actually read some of the Spanish and understand it and then see how it was translated. So super enjoyed this, and I hope to get through a couple more of these in the year. Then there is The Omnivore's Dilemma, A Natural History of Four Meals by Michael Pollan. I think that this is a book that I built up in my head to be something amazing and super hard hitting, but then I took so long to actually read it that it's not really that anymore. <laughs> Um, so I'd only read one other thing by Michael Pollan in the past. I read his little food rules book, which I actually keep in my kitchen with my cookbooks. It's all about like, what is food? What are some rules for eating real food well? Um, I really like that. So I'd always meant to read The Omnivore's Dilemma. This was published in 2006-ish, I think. So it's a good like 15 years old now. And this was partly like a blast from the past, like from a specific era that I remember very vividly, and then some new stuff for me. So when I first started reading this, I was kind of disappointed because it's just all stuff I already knew, like the whole discussion of like high fructose corn syrup and when people started talking about the organic movement and all of that. It was so very... 2005 for me. Um, like, I lived through a lot of this stuff. There's a whole part of the book where Michael Pollan goes to um, Polyface Farms to talk to Joel Salatin, and I'm like, I remember being 16 years old and my parents buying Joel Salatin's books and talking about them and everything. Um, so like th that was a period of my life, like 2005 to th 2006 was when I started really paying attention to food. Um, I grew up in a vegetarian family, but we discovered like the big vegan and organic boom around 2005 and 2006 and just all of these things. My family has always been very interested in these topics. So it was a big major point of discussion for my family for a long time time. So I think that's why a lot of this book felt extremely familiar and not as, like I said, like hard hitting anymore. Like I'd already had this conversation. This was old news. Then I finally got into the second half of the book, which was more about like a critique of the food systems and the reality of organic farming, which I actually didn't know anything about. And then also like hunting and the, the mushroom foraging section. I like these a lot better because they are topics I just had never 
read as much about or at all. So the book was kind of a bumpy ride for me. I also sometimes felt like I didn't quite understand what Michael Pollan's attitude was towards food consumers. Clearly the book is a critique of our big capitalistic food production system in the US. But sometimes I felt like he was upset about it and kind of pointing fingers at consumers. And then other times I felt like he was not doing that. I just wasn't sure how to interpret it. And I feel like if this book were written today or if it were to be updated, there would be much more of a discussion over um, why people have to eat the way that they do because of the constraints of the system and like where does the blame lie on that basically. But I don't think it was very clear in this. Either way, it was an interesting read. I'm glad that I finally read this book, um, but I was a bit shocked perhaps at how much the topics in it had already been deeply ingrained in my life, probably just because of the history of dietary habits in my family when I was growing up. And then I ended January on a really high note with Akata Woman by Nnedi Okorafor. This is the third book in the uh, Insabidi Scripts series that begins with Akata Witch and Akata Warrior. I love the series. These are my favorite books by Nnedi Okorafor. I think I can say that pretty definitively. I've enjoyed a lot of her things. I loved Binti, enjoyed Lagoon, etc. But these books have my heart in a way that the others don't really do. Um, so I buddy read Akata Woman with my friend Nicole. Um, she's on Instagram as Dorka Brain. Uh, we read Akata Warrior together a couple of years ago. I think that was like, oh my god, 2018? It's been a while. Uh, we really loved that book and we were excited to read this one together. So this series is about Sunny, a Nigerian-American girl now living in Nigeria as a teenager. She's albino and she finds out that she is a leopard person. She has a magical gift and she enters into the leopard people society. She's training and discovering her talents and she's special. She's got some unique things going on with her and it's about her, her learning, her growing up, becoming this really strong strong, powerful person, both with her magic, but also like physically, which I think is a fascinating part of the story. Um, it's also about her her friends, like these lifelong friends that she forms and they're kind of witch coven in a way. And this book concludes a storyline with Odide, who's like the spider goddess. Um, they have to retrieve something for her um, while learning more about themselves along the way. So I super enjoyed this. I found the, the quest of this to be really satisfying. I loved the development of that story and the new parts of the world and perhaps other worlds that we get to see. And I liked how it concluded and how you could tell that the characters were growing up and becoming stronger and standing up for themselves in different ways. What I found kind of odd about the book though is that there's stuff going on in the mundane world with the the lamb family basically. Um, Non-leopard people are called lambs. Um, so Sunny's family are lambs. They don't know about leopard people and magic and all of that. They don't know what's going on with her. And there's kind of this storyline about what her family is going through. They are not sure where she is going when she's going off to to learn magic or on her quest they're upset with her her father is very angry with her and there's also like this anniversary of the biafran civil war happening and when we were reading this nicole and i really thought that the story was going to circle back around to like the civil war and the stresses on sunny's family but then the book ends the mundane part in a completely different way that intersects with real world events. And I did not find that to, to really work for me. Um, there's also this conflict between Sunny and her father, which was really upsetting in the middle of the book. And you know that they are gonna have to come together and deal with that again. But then it just like peters out. There's no real conversation. Um, it was not satisfying. And I wasn't expecting that. Usually I find that a core for like she wraps things up, she addresses things head on and so it was a bit odd to me that these aspects of the book just did not did not work for me. 
I don't know if there's gonna be another book. Um, I actually think that this one wraps up all of the major plot threads in a really good way, um, but the ending was a little bit rushed in some aspects, and it really made me wonder if there should be a fourth book at some point that picks up maybe on like the Mbakwa test for Sunny and that like going up another level or something. But if this is the end, I can understand that, but I will always hope for more. All right, those are all the things that I read in January. Like reflecting back on these, I realized I read a lot of good stuff in January. Like Witch Please was the only major disappointment. Everything else was really good or thought provoking and in a good way. So I am very happy with that. Let me know if you have also read any of these. If you have thoughts on them, please leave me a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll be back to talk to you again soon about other things. And until then, bye.